Speaker Kelleher, Representative Thiessen, and Mayor Ryback. The question is, how will you identify appointees with an eye toward appointing people who will prioritize measurable reductions in racial inequity in Minnesota? Speaker Kelleher. Well, thank you for that question, and thank you, Demetria, me, Francisco, Liz, Frank, for framing this for all of us. I think that this is a place where we can make really a big difference in the lives of Minnesotans, partly because we start from a very uh, low base of being able to make the difference. <laughs> so we have to recognize just how badly we've done here and how we can change it and make it better. And I feel a lot of passion around this because in being able to make a measurable difference, first of all, uh, wouldn't we have to measure, right? We would have to measure where we are today and have a baseline. We would then need to report back to the community, including the Take Action community and this table, but the bar broader community as well, and then being able to hold people accountable. I would look for appointees, especially at the commissioner level appointees and assistant commissioner level appointees, who have some specific principles that I want to follow in my commissioner appointees. First of all, expertise in the area that they are going to be a commissioner over. Wouldn't that be refreshing from where we have been? The second is uh, managing people, which I think is another important skill that we haven't seen measured. And then being able to add into that the uh, track record that that person has in outreach to communities of color. But that should start at the top, and that should start in the governor's office, in the transition team and how the transition team looks, because that transition team, I know how those work from hearing from people. That is where recruitment is happening already. So we need to make sure that people are represented on the transition team, that that moves forward with the appointments, and I will make sure that that is happening. Now I'm going to talk specifically about some of the work that I have done. I have done work around these issues in my current executive role in making the decision to include uh, more openly Native American people in the work that we've been doing at the Capitol. What I was finding as a member of the minority in the Minnesota House, that all the issues came around the gaming issue. And I thought, wow, I mean, that is a disservice to all of us because there are so many more issues. So I started something called Indian Law 101. We're now on 104. We bring in experts for a day where lawmakers can hear the law and legal issues as well as discuss the real issues. I also think that it's important in the work that we've done to do Somali capital for a day, as well as honoring the Hmong veterans. So I think there's a lot that can be done by the governor. The other piece of this, oh, I'm gonna run out of time. I'll try to weave it into the next answer. Thank you. Just, just a moment, Paul. I might wanna add that each candidate has 2.5 minutes. <laughs> uh, and we, have, we have a time keeper right here. Yeah, thank you. Oh, all right, for it. Well, first, uh, I want to start a little bit away from the question uh, because I think it, it is important as we approach these issues to really take, um, you know, the last story especially, but all the stories I heard, I think should really make all of us outraged about what is going on in Minnesota. And as we think about these issues and what Minnesota government can do, it's not just an intellectual uh, exercise, but those kind of stories that we have to have in our gut as we take forward and make these decisions. And so your participation and continued participation in kind of sharing that is what's going on. And then I think the governor's role in one thing is to translate that to the broader public, to talk about those things to the broader public, because that is fundamentally a way that we can change the direction in the state. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of, all of your stories. Clearly the appointment process, we have to reflect the state of Minnesota. It's something that uh, I think I'm very, very much committed to, and I think it does come back to the Renew vision. You know, what is binding us together, one of the things that binds us together in this renewed Minnesota vision is we're all in this together, and that we need to move forward that way. And so the first thing I guess I would say as I'm thinking about appointments, is this is this squeaking too much? Can I do it this way, or does that bother your thing? All right, I'm just going to speak, if I can speak without it, I'd rather do that. 
So the first thing, <laughs> the first thing that I would say about this is I want to make sure that everybody that I've appointed, whether it's commissioner, uh, uh, assistant commissioner, all the way down, shares in the vision because we all have to be pulling on the oars in the same direction if we're going to make uh, make change. And so that's really critically important. The second thing I think is really important is that we don't view these, as people mentioned, as individual agencies dealing with issues related to people of color. Because these things cut across. And this is true not just on racial issues, but all kinds of issues. So the Department of Human Services does have immense power to, to, to address all kinds of uh, racial diversity. We can't, so we gotta move beyond this idea that it's only about issues that deal with people of color and we appoint people of color and other people that have passion around these issues to all of our agencies. And I'm very much committed to doing that. The last thing that I guess I would say with my 30 seconds left here um, is that as we move forward together on this, I don't want it to just be thinking of African Americans and Asian Americans and all of these categories. There's much more diversity even within those categories that we have to understand and getting down to that granular level of understanding the community on the ground as they interact with each other. That will be really important both to me and to my commissioners and assistant commissioners to making sure they're getting out into those communities Time's out. to better understand that. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Let me answer the question directly, and then we, let me then, if I have a couple seconds, talk to the larger values on it. The, the question really is about appointments, and when you really think about it, is you should hold the governor candidate accountable. But if we're going to be partners, we're going to hold each other accountable. And here's what I ask: right now, we need to be thinking aggressively about who fits into all of those positions well and who represents different communities. We cannot and should not wait until later. I expect that out of this group, and you can expect me to be receptive to that. We absolutely have to have people who look like the state of Minnesota, but there was a word that was used in there who reach out to. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly how that was. That's really the key. I've seen too many cases where someone who is of a group or looks the right way to represent communities doesn't do the second part of that work, which is it's not about just them. It's about them each being their own community organizer, going out and bringing people in. And that's one of the things that's good about my experience as a mayor. I've had an eight-year crash course in cultural diversity. There is no issue here that we have dealt with that I haven't dealt with. Some very well and some not, but I bring tremendous grassroots experience with that. What I think is really important about that is to really recognize the fact that I cannot possibly represent all of the state of Minnesota nor can you or you or you. Together we can do a pretty darn good job. We also need, I think, at this point in time to disproportionately try to bring to the table voices that have not been part of that. And we need to recognize the specific issues. The, the question you, you asked is an incredibly good one. Now the good news is you can go to work in the city of Minneapolis because having heard stories like that, we changed the law so we're not going to ask about your criminal background when you come to do a non-emergency job there. When people, I came into the mayor's office right after 9-11, when the Bush administration and a year later the Pawlenty administration would be targeting immigrants. So I spent a tremendous amount of time going out to Latino churches and walking through people, what that really meant about equity and how our police and immigration would be kept separate because that was so important. I did the same with people uh, of all different cultures. When I appointed the first African American fire chief in the history of Minneapolis, a fire department that historically was one of the most racist departments in the country and now is the most diverse fire department in the country. It was not just about a person, it was a value system. I'm really fortunate that I grew up in two worlds. I lived in a middle class neighborhood in South Minneapolis. My parents had a drugstore in first an African American neighborhood and then one with a large American Indian population. I grew up understanding that this world operates on a couple different levels. And we need to, and especially as governor, I need to bring those together. Thank you, Mayor Ryback. Okay, the second question is about governing. This time we're going to go Ryback, Thiessen, and Kelleher. All right. The, the question is, Mayor Ryback. We fully expect to work very hard to elect one of you as governor of Minnesota and co-govern with you. How will you work with renewed leaders in your transition to governing? I talked a bit in the transition of governing about us getting involved in that process right now and doing that work right now.
But um, I want to tell a very quick story. I was at a, um, there was a protest at City Hall. And I go to a lot of protests and listen and learn and all that. And there was a woman standing there with a microphone. And she was saying, when is City Hall going to listen? And I said, I'm right here. I want to say that because what's important is that's really what we should be about. I frankly think it would be a big mistake if this incredible organization was about saying, let's get a governor and then let's hold that governor accountable. Hold me accountable, but let's be partners. That's what I think is incredibly important about this work. Now let's look at how I've solved problems before. Unemployment in the city of Minneapolis. Today, for the first time in history, it's below the regional and the suburb suburban level. That's a huge thing. It wasn't because we created a city jobs program. It's because we partnered with community-based organizations on the ground with a wide range of different communities representing everyone in this room and much more, and that's how we solved unemployment. How did we really address youth violence? We brought all of those people to the table who were engaged, and sadly, that fell disproportionately on communities of color. How did we really address learning gaps? I look at Peggy Flanagan on the school board. Remember that great night at Little Earth where we had parents there and saying to, to parents of very young kids, well before school age, how we could engage with them to be part of educating. This is really about getting out in community. And I think one of the things you'll see about my work, and I think I mentioned it in the other room, I haven't gotten everything right. I've stumbled badly in places, but I show up. And that is an incredibly important part of it. Think about the images you've seen on me on television. In good times, mostly in bad, I've been out there. I think about a hideous incident when allegedly a police officer sodomized a person in North Minneapolis with a plunger. And that wound up not being true. But that night, when that happened, North Minneapolis would have exploded had I not gone out and sat in a room with 500 furious people and take the heat and then find out the truth. That's my job. I don't come to that and make that as a promise in a campaign. That's my record. What I love about the state is it's a big state filled with lots of different people. I'm going to show up. I need you to talk to me. I will listen. I'm not a lawyer by training. Most politicians are. They argue a case. I'm a journalist. I ask questions. I learn the story, and then I get up and try to solve a problem. Again, I won't always do it right, but I can do it a whole lot better if we're at the table together. Thank you, Mayor Ivan. Thank you. Um, well, the trend, I think this is a partnership. Again, this is the fundamental thing about your vision that is so exciting, is that it's about this mutual accountability. And so in the transition team, to answer the question directly, absolutely, you are all going to be at the table, and all of your communities are going to be at the table. It's something that we have, I have made sure we do in the legislature, and my work on health care is getting out in the community and talking to people about what's going on in their community, and we're going to continue to do that, and taking my committee out across the state to hear what's going on in other parts of the state. This is not just a metropolitan government that we're dealing with, but a statewide government, right? So here's the other thing that I want to say about this that I think is really important, because we can talk all day about the mechanics of, of government and how that's going to work, and it's really, really important, and getting that transition right and getting the right voices at the table is really, really important. But there's one other thing to this mutual accountability that I think is going to be very important now and through the campaign and through the transition and into the governing. And that is this, we all come at this, and every single one of us comes at the job of governing, the job of thinking about public policy issues, about where we need this to take the state, based on where we're standing and where we've come from. And that absolutely means that I come to these decisions that I have to make with certain blinders on. Blinders that come with privilege that I've grown up with as a, you know, as a white person, as a man, I suppose, as well. And one of the things that you can really do as part of this process is continue to challenge me on those grounds. Uh, and continue to challenge me so that I can take those blinders off and so I can challenge you to take the blinders off that, have come, that you bring to the table as well. I think getting at that more fundamental deep level of discussion, aside from just talking about who can fill a particular position, that's something that I really want to do going forward. It's something I'm very committed to uh, and I you know, really look forward to continuing the discussion in that direction. Thank you so much for having us here, having me here, uh, for your support through this process. Is it really, really has meant a great deal. I have learned an amazing amount and will continue to learn an amazing amount and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Well, I started to address this question a little bit in the last question because I do think it's important that you have a seat at the table, not just in the campaign process, but also in the governing process. And that begins with the transition. 
Now, I'm sorry to say I am a little bit superstitious. I think you better win an election before you plan it all out. So I, I think that we need to be ready on November 3rd. Because on November 3rd, the next governor will have 12 and a half weeks to put that entire state budget together. A state budget that will be somewhere around $34 billion. And so to have the teams, build the teams that are going to come together, I want you there. This is your invitation. We are going to make sure that we are doing this together and building it together. When I think about what has happened to our Department of Education, when you think about where we are today, it is a black eye that we have the largest achievement gap in this state. As a public school parent, I find that disturbing. As a governor, I will change that. And here is one of the places that that change has to happen. The Metropolitan Council in law shall work with the Department of Education yeah. to close the achievement gap. But are we doing it today? No, we are not doing it today. We must do it together. We must make sure there are places to come together, both informal and formal, to come around the largest and most vexing challenges we have to solve the problems. I think about things systematically, probably a little differently, because I am not a lawyer, I'm not a journalist, I'm a community organizer. And when I think about how you come around making lasting and enduring change to be able to get that done, you need to think about the system, the positive and negative effects on making those changes. And so I think about that every day, about how we do action to make that happen. And I will not rest so we can say, after we're done doing this together, that we have made marked, measurable change for the positive in the way that we're governing together. So I want to thank you for all of your time. Like I said, I am not going to be shy about this. This has ignited a fire in me, the Renew Vision. And it ignites me every day to keep going. We need to harness that power, that energy. What is fire? It is energy. Let's keep it going, everyone. Thank you.